in a second. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking the time to come learn a few things. I love it. Well, to hopefully learn a few things. That's the goal, at least. <laughs> cool. In a minute here, we'll get it rolling. Oh, you know what? Did you did you start it? There? Yeah, perfect. I was just gonna say that. it's I basically six thirty. Agreed. Let the people have what they want. As soon as it clicks over, we'll we'll get it. Ooh, more in the waiting room now. So let them in as long as they behave. So is everybody here from Minnesota? Living in Minnesota? No. I'm seeing a lot of no's. Yeah. I, I'm Hi. from New Hampshire. Oh. Wow. Wow. All right. Hi. All right. Yeah. It's awesome. awesome. Hop in the chat where you're coming from. I'd love to see where you guys are coming from. From the Bronx, living in Miami Beach. Ooh, nice. 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 Southern California for me. Oh, man. I wish I was there right now. That sounds pretty Ooh, nice. Denver, nice. Yeah, type in the chat. I'd love to hear where everybody's coming from. I know you said uh, Miami Beach, Minnesota, nice. New Hampshire, thank you. And is it Ellie? Am I saying that right? Eli. Eli, okay. Working to their faces. <laughs> <laughs> Buffalo, Minnesota. Where's that, Brennan? I remember my first date for Zabrosa. Brennan, go ahead. It's a suburb of the Twin Cities, I think. Okay, nice. Minnesota, lots of Minnesotas. Nice. Good. Again, welcome everybody. Well, Alex, should we get started? It's about that time. Sure, I'm ready if you guys are. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we're really, really excited to have Alex on here. Um, my name is Dave Strong. If you don't know me, this is Aaron Levine from the Schmidt Music Saxophone Shop here in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. What's up, guys? And really, we're gonna we're gonna stop talking and get things started. But I, I do want to talk about a couple things real quick, actually. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, Alex is gonna is gonna talk for a bit here. Throw them in the chat. Uh, I'm sure he'll ask if he if he's got a moment for any questions. But we'll also be I'll be looking at the Zoom chat. Aaron's gonna be looking at the YouTube chat. And we'll be paying attention and writing stuff down. So if you have a question and you feel like you, you're not, there's not a place to ask it, we will have time at the end and we'll be keeping track of those the best we can. Uh, but yeah, the other, the other big thing is we really want to thank Eastman Winds for helping us out, uh, helping us get Alex here. That's really, really cool. And, and giving us all the cool Eastman saxes that we get, uh, get through here a lot. They've been uh, really fun. So uh, before uh, we hand over to Alex, first we're going to hand over to Shane Duell. Our, our contact at Eastman Winds, our rep uh, with them, and he's going to do a real quick introduction. We'll get started. Hey, thanks for uh, making this happen, Sax Shop, uh, Dave and Aaron. This is this is awesome. And I have to say, one of my favorite things about my job, my, my title is Regional Sales Director, which means I travel to, well, I used to travel, and I will again soon, to 12 states. And one of my favorite things is just the amazing people I, I get to meet and work with. Uh, from music stores to artists like Alex Han. And I have to tell you, a big kudos to the sax shop. I, I travel to a lot of different music stores and the selection they have and the accessories they, they have there, there's nowhere in the 12 states I go that has what they have. So you're, you're super fortunate if you live in the Twin Cities area. It's an amazing resource. And not just do they have great stuff on the walls, but uh, the expertise they have and I mean, you talk to Dave and Aaron about their playing experience and it's phenomenal uh, what, the, what they've done. So really great resource there. One of my favorite things to do is help connect amazing artists that uh, we work with at Eastman to people like you who've come on to this Zoom call. So I'd like to just hand it over to Alex Hahn, one of our favorite artists to work with, and he's gonna give you an amazing clinic. Over to you, Alex. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it, um, making it making it happen for me to be here. I'm looking forward to working with all you guys. Um, again, if you haven't in, already in the chat, would love to hear where you guys are coming from, where you're zooming in from. So please type in the chat. I um, would love to hear if you're if, if you're in Minnesota, if you're somewhere else. I uh, would love to hear where you're coming from. Um, also, if you if you feel comfortable, would love to see your bright, shining, beautiful faces to turn on your cameras um, as well. Again, if you don't feel comfortable, no worries. But would love to see your Sh uh, shiny faces, as I mentioned. Um, Winona State, welcome, Melanie. Thank you so much for being here. 
Cool. So a little bit about me. I'm not going to talk very long about me because I want to get into um, the meat and potatoes here. Um, but um, I'm a saxophonist, composer, arranger, educator. Um, I went to the University of North Texas for my undergrad where I played in the one o'clock lab band. I did my master's at USC where I was a teaching assistant uh, under Bob Mincer, who has visited the sax shop before. Um, and then I did my, um, I did another master's degree at UCLA in, in part with the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz where I got to perform with Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and Jimmy Heath and learn from all of these legends, Chris Potters, um, your Dick Oates, all of these guys came in for these residencies and I got to work with them and study with them. And um, now I'm a teacher educator freelance um I make my own albums um have a pretty strong skype studio just trying to make it all happen here and again thank you shane thank you all you guys at, at the sack shop um, for having me here today enough about me let's get into the meat and potatoes here um before we kind of get into this clinic i wanted to uh play a little tune for you um you guys can get a sense of how i play some things that um um, hopefully you'll enjoy so this is one of my favorite um sta jazz standards to play uh, it's been recorded thousands and thousands of times one of the most recorded jazz standards of all time this is body and soul <laughs> Body and Soul, one of my favorite tunes. Man, I will never get used to playing here on Zoom and just hearing no applause or no anything after finished playing. It's so strange. 
Um, we were clapping, I promise. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Uh, again, Body and Soul, um, a beautiful tune. I love to play it, especially the rubato kind of feel like that where I'm not kind of restricted to a certain tempo or a certain anything. Um, one of my favorite tunes to play. Okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Um, there's kind of two main things that I really wanted to talk about. Uh, actually, three main things that I wanted to talk about today in terms of how we can build um, – our fundamentals on the saxophone. And the reason why I feel like that is so important because when you listen to somebody like Chris Potter or Dick Oates or Bob Mincer or Lester Young or John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, any of your favorite saxophone players, what they all have in common is the incredible ability to have an amazing sound and amazing technique on the instrument. And so honing in those skills and honing in those fundamentals are incredibly important no matter what level that we are this is something that i've kind of rededicated myself to learning to play the saxophone again because in 2020 when all the gigs were canceled when um there was kind of like no end in sight in terms of the covid i was really not inspired to practice at all and i think i probably practiced four or five times in the year 2020 you know, once March hit and that's terrible. And I wasn't inspired because there was no one to play with. There was nothing. I was just, I wasn't excited to play. And so one of my goals for 2021 was to start practicing again, was to start taking saxophone a little bit more seriously, was to get back to fundamentals, to work on my tone, to work on my time, to work on my technique. Because to me, again, no matter what age we are, no matter what age or what stage of our development we are in, those are some things, those are three things that we always need to be working on. So I wanted to cover a few of those things today. And then again, as they mentioned, if you have any questions along the way, just blurt it out, type it in the chat, type it in YouTube, you know, message them directly and they can get that answer to you. We'll have some time at the end um, to make sure that your questions will get asked. So first thing I wanted to talk about is tone. To me, this is the most important thing about being um, a saxophone player or being a horn player in general is hearing somebody's sound. That's the first thing that you can hear. That's the first thing that you hear when you listen to Bird, when you listen to Johnny Hodges, when you listen to Joe Henderson, when you listen to all these guys as you hear the tone first. And you could be, be playing the baddest stuff on the planet, bad meaning good, obviously, jazz lingo for those of you who aren't hip. Um, if you could be playing the baddest stuff on the planet, but if you have a terrible sound or you know, if you're, if you're, if your sound isn't happening, nobody's going to care to listen. So to me, playing with a good sound is always super, super important. Um, something that I do want everybody to type in the chat, type in somebody who has a, a saxophone tone that you love. And I want to see what answers we come up with. This could be Johnny Hodges to me has an amazing sound. Cannibal Adderley. I love his sound. Ooh, Oliver Nelson. Nice. Ca Cannibal. I'm right there with you, Melanie. Um, Totally cannonball. Thick oats too. I love. Again, type in the chat. It could be tenor. It could be Barry. It could be alto. Um, it could be soprano. Sidney Mache. Again, it could be anybody. But type in the chat your favorite um, saxophone tone. Phil Woods. Fantastic choice. Um, let's see some more. Ooh, Leo P has an amazing sound. Uh, he's a homie too. He's a great dude. I love. I've loved playing with him. I've played with him a couple times. Um, let's see some more. Favorite saxophone tone. Stanley Turrentine. Woo! Good choice, Shane. Oh, nice, Eli. Love it. Oh, Michelle, I don't know him. You'll have to get me hip. Leo P, nice. David Sanborn, yes, absolutely. Fantastic choices. Now, the reason why this is important, and this is the only part of this masterclass that's going to be a little bit abstract and a little bit tough to kind of, um, kind of to fathom because everything else is going to be very specific and very to the point. But the more that we listen, the more we sound like the people that we listen to. If we're listening to Cannonball day and night, if we listen to Cannonball when we're going to sleep, if we're, we're in class when we're supposed to be listening, we're listening to Cannonball when we're practicing, when we're cooking, when we're cleaning, when we're you know tidying up the house, when we're going out to eat, if we're listening to Cannonball day and night, the, the sound concept for Cannonball will be around our 
our, in our brain, and most importantly, in our ear. And the more that we can listen to our favorite players, the more important it's going to be to build that sound concept and you'll start to hear that sound when you start to play. And, the, and that's true in terms of the way that we build improvisation, the way that we build composition. It's true of anything in terms of music is we are always, no matter what age, no matter what stage of our development, we are always in the information accumulation business. It is our job to accumulate and to absorb as much information as possible. That's why it's so important that when we're building our sound and we're building our concept for sound is we're listening to our favorite players. And the reason why this is important is because saxophone is such a beautiful instrument that there are such a wide variety of sounds that you can get out of the, out of the saxophone. For example, for those of you who know Paul Desmond and those of you who know David Sanborn, those sounds could not be more different. Paul Desmond, dark, airy, very light. But David Sanborn is edgy, bright, in your face. Like, it's crazy to me that every time I think about this, that they're playing the same instrument, but the sound is so different. And so the reason why building our sound concept is so important is because we want to find where we're going to fit on this spectrum. We want to find, do we want a sound that's not too dark, not too bright, just kind of right down the middle? I think of somebody like Charlie Parker. Do I want a darker sound, something with more depth, with more warmth, um, with more body? I think of somebody like Cannibal. Do I want to be on the brighter side? I, I think about Kenny Garrett. I think about um, David Sanborn, like, like the YouTuber mentioned. Um, you know, the more that we listen, the more that our sound concept grows. The more our sound concept grows, the more that sound is going to come out of the instrument. That is the first thing. And again, this is the only part that's going to be a little bit abstract, but I challenge you and I urge you to listen to as much music as you can. And my favorite thing about music and my favorite thing about the saxophone is everybody's likes are different. Is you may listen, you may check out David Sanborn and you may go, oh, that's way too edgy and way too bright. I don't like that at all. And that's fantastic. You could listen to Paul Desmond and be like, oh, it's so small. It's so airy. It's so light. Like, oh, I don't like that at all. That's fantastic too. It's we're trying to figure out your musical personality and the way that you hear music. And to me, that's what makes jazz. That's what makes saxophone. That's what makes music so special is everybody's interpretation is important or is, is different and important. So the more that you listen to your favorite players, the more that you start to build your musical personality and your sound concept. That's number one. So now let's start to dive into some specifics because building the sound concept and listening is obviously important, as I've mentioned a few times already but there are a bunch of very specific exercises that I've done that have really helped me in terms of the development of my sound and developing the development of my sound concept. So I want to start with just the neck of the saxophone. How many, how many of you guys play alto saxophone type in the chat? If you play alto, just type alto or yeah, I do great. Fantastic. How about tenor type in the chat? If you play tenor, Ooh, a lot of alto players. Nice, nice, nice. Tanner, Tanner, nice. How about some Barry players? Yes, nice. Yeah, Eli, you mentioned you play Barry. Very cool. Yeah, great. How about soprano? Or how about all four? Who plays all four? Type in the chat. Soprano, nice. Very cool. Oh, thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that. Nice. So I'm going to start with alto because that's my main, but this applies to any of the instruments that you're playing is I always like to start on the neck and I always like to think about four things when I'm thinking about the creation of my sound. These four things are breathing correctly, which we'll get to in a second. The embouchure the shape of your oral cavity, and your airstream. 
We'll go over those four things in way more detail than we just did. Again, breathing correctly, embouchure, oral cavity shape, and airstream. Those are the biggest factors that go into how the sound is created. And again, we build our sound concept. We listen. We, we, we build our concept. We, we're listening. We're listening. We're listening. We're playing. We're listening. And that's fantastic. But now we want to hone our skills. Think about it like this. If we went to the Olympics and we're a javelin thrower, that javelin thrower needs to practice hours and hours and hours to get the exact arm angle that, to release that javelin, the exact muscle movement. And they're trying to hone those muscle movements from, from their arms to, 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 to getting the power from their legs, all of that stuff in order to hone their skills. And that's essentially what's happening here is we want to control the muscles. We want to control those four factors that go into creating the sound. So let's start with um, the first one, which is breathing correctly. My teacher at North Texas, uh, Brad Lely, amazing saxophone player. He played for the Count Basie band. He played for Harry Connick Jr.'s band. Um, amazing saxophonist, amazing teacher. I learned so much from him. And I remember in a lesson, this was actually like, I think it was like my senior year. So I was about to graduate. And in a lesson, he says, you know what, Alex? You have a good sound, but you don't have a great sound. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And he said, the reason why is because you're not breathing correctly. And I said, what? What are you talking about? I'm not breathing correctly. I'm just breathing. And he's like, and explain this whole thing that I'm going to explain to you guys here today is we want to be breathing from the diaphragm. And we want to think about our diaphragm as a balloon. When that balloon is filling up with air, it's expanding. When that balloon is releasing air, it's contracting. So we want to think of our diaphragm the same exact way. So when we're breathing, I'm going to stand up, see if I um, get the right angle here. As we see my diaphragm here, right? And what we're going to do is I'm going to breathe in. I want you to listen to that breath. I'm going to do it right in the microphone. Sorry if it sounds weird. I want you to listen to that compared to this. You hear the difference in that breath? The first one, much deeper, much more full. We're getting the best quality air from the best quality source, which is going to help create the best quality sound. And so when we breathe with our shoulders or when we breathe with our chest, we're not getting the air directly from the source. We're not getting it directly from the diaphragm. So I spent a long time after that lesson with, Mr. with Professor Lily practicing in front of the mirror just practicing, looking at my diaphragm and practicing along, trying to get my breathing correct. That's number one. Number two is the embouchure. This is something I learned when I was at USC studying with Bob Shepard, who's an amazing saxophone player, studio musician. Um, he's played with Chick Corea, Freddie Hubbard. The list goes on and on. He's played with absolutely everybody. And we we're talking about embouchure. And again, I get to this point where it's two years down the road and I've developed two or three years later. And he says, man, Alex, you got a good sound, but you don't have a great sound. And here I am again, like, wait, what? Like, what are you guys talking about? I already did this. Like I already did this once. And he said, oh yeah, your embouchure could be set better in order to help the vibration of the reed. And I'm like, uh, okay, explain it. And this is what he explained is my tendency. I'm going to get kind of close to the camera here is to be rolled in to the mouthpiece. Meaning when I put my bottom lip, sorry, I hit the mic. Uh, when I, when I hit my bottom lip, I was going like this and putting a ton of extra pressure down on the reed. And my dad's a saxophone player. Um, so I studied with him for, for, for a while when I was growing up. Um, and obviously I did band and band and jazz band in middle school and high school, but I had always played with this amateur that was rolled in. Now what that's doing is two things. It's putting additional pressure down on your lip because your lip is now digging into your bottom teeth. It's also putting additional pressure up against the reed, which is hindering the vibration. The reason why that's important is because as we know, the vibration is the sound. The more the reed vibrates, that's how the sound is created. So what we want to do 
um, is find the sweet spot in terms of how our embouchure should be created. And this could be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you've been doing it a certain way for a number of years, which was exactly the case for me. Is here I am getting my master's degree in jazz studies from USC, which is a great music school. And here I am basically relearning how to, to create my embouchure. So it happened to me. So it's a little bit uncomfortable at first to kind of relearn, but here's what we need to do. The other thing that we want to avoid, actually, before we get to that, the other thing that we want to avoid is being too rolled out with our, with our embouchure. So we don't want to be rolled in like this. And we don't want to be rolled out like this because if we're too rolled out, now we can't control the vibration of the reed and it's going to be kind of a little bit out of control. Yeah. I don't know much about the Joe Allard approach. Is, is it Zeldy? Am I saying that right? Or is it Zeld? Zelda. Zelda. Love, love it. Thanks for chiming in. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly um, if, if it's the exact Joe, Joe Allard approach, but I'll say it like this. There are a lot of very prominent saxophone players on YouTube who say, this is John Coltrane's embouchure. This is the exact embouchure that you need. This is what Joe Henderson did. This is exactly what you need to do. Here's what this person did. Charlie Parker, Cannonball, fill in the blank with your favorite saxophone player. And this is the embouchure that you need. To me, that makes no sense. Everybody's mouth is different. Everybody's lips are different. Everybody's jawline is different. Everybody's everything is different. We're all humans here. And so to me, for me to have the same embouchure as John Coltrane doesn't make any sense. He was kind of rolled out a little bit more than I am. He made it work for himself, his own, his own lips, his own jaw, his own mouthpiece, his own everything. So you may be asking yourself, well, if I can't recreate an embouchure from fill in the blank, how do I find the best embouchure for me? Again, we want to find an embouchure that's not too rolled in and that's not too rolled out. So this is what we do. I want you to think about a puppet or a nutcracker. When that nutcracker, the bottom of that nutcracker is going up, the bottom lip is not moving any direction except for 90 degrees straight up. It's not going, it's not going, all it's doing is moving directly up 90 degrees. So that's how I want you to create the embouchure is I want you to put your top teeth on the mouthpiece and bring up your bottom lip up to the reed. What this is doing is creating the most natural embouchure for your lips, for your mouth, for your jaw, for your everything. When I was taking lessons with Dick Oates when I was at the Alphonia Smoke Institute, is he told me that he, he likes to think that he plays with no embouchure, which is hilarious because obviously that's impossible. But the reason why he said that is because he wants to be relaxed. Like he just wants his most natural lip position and, and, and mouth position and all that stuff just to be relaxed. And so to me, that's reiterating what I learned from Bob Shepard is just put that bottom lip up to the reed and that's our most natural position. So to me, that really helped me in terms of my sound, opening up the sound, opening the vibration of the reed, really helped my sound tremendously in terms of opening up, opening it up a little bit more. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Now, the third thing is the shape of the oral cavity. For those of you who play alto and tenor and barry and soprano, all the saxophones, this was something that completely blew my mind in terms of switching back and forth between all the different saxophones, which was the shape of our oral cavity. I'm sure in Minnesota, which seems like a lot of you are from Minnesota, it gets very cold and it gets way colder than my comfort level, which is why I would live in Southern California. I have a very small window of comfortability, like 65 to like 80. And like either that's too hot or too cold besides that. Um, so that's why I live here. But when it's cold outside and we have our hands cupped like this and we blow warm air into your hands, if you're, if, if you're, um, if I can see you, or even if I, if I, if, if I can't blow warm air into your hands like this, what are you noticing about how this feels here? Feels very open, 
She feels very relaxed. That's the oral cav relax. Exactly. Brendan. Thank you. Appreciate it. But um, that's the oral cavity shape that we should have when we're playing. Funny enough. I had a high school teacher who said, Alex, you got to play with warm air. You got to play with the warm air. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? Warm air. I can't control how hot my breath is. Like, what are you talking about? And then I started to learn about this oral cavity shape. And I was like, Oh, that makes perfect sense. So again, the oral cavity shape determines that warm air. So we want to open this up. We want this to be nice and open, nice and relaxed, because that's the last pathway that the air needs to take before it goes into the mouthpiece. So again, we're blowing that warm air. And this is opening up and being nice and relaxed. The other way I like to think about it is if you're tired um, and you yawn, Sorry, that, that turned into a real one. Sorry. I was faking it, but that turned into a real one. Um, it's the same effect. Is That's really opening up. That's really relaxed. Um, that same um, sort of feeling uh, in terms of how our oral cavity is being shaped. So again, we got breathing correctly. We got the new embouchure, setting that nice and natural embouchure for you. And then the... Um, and then the shape of the oral cavity, three tremendous factors that go into, um, that go into creating and developing your sound. Now, the other thing that I want to point out before we get to the airstream, which is number four, is has everybody ever heard of long tones before? I'm sure this is review for a lot of you, um, but type in the chat if you've heard of long tones before. Yes. Zelda, yes. Um, Ellie, yes. Or sorry, Eli, my fault. Um, yes, yes, definitely. Um, and the first time I heard about long tones, um, it was in high school and I, I went home and I'm like, okay, I'm going to hold out this note and that makes my tone better. And so here I am doing it, holding it out. And I'm like, how the heck is this making my tone better? This makes no sense. And it, it just didn't click about why this was making my tone better. Like, was it strengthening the reed? Was it like air? Like I, I didn't understand it at all. So I really, I always like to explain it because to me, when I understood it better, I could practice it better, be more efficient with my practicing better and just, it would be more effective. So the reason why we do long tones is to control those three things. And actually those four things that I mentioned. We do long tones so we can control the consistency of the embouchure, the consistency of the airstream, the consistency of the oral cavity shape, and the consistency of our breathing. And the more consistent those things are, the more consistent our sound is going to be. So when you're doing your long tones, you need to be thinking of those four factors. You also need to be listening to what the sound sounds like. Is it wavering? Is the intonation changing? Is the timbre of the note is changing? Is it going flat at the end? Is it going sharp at the end? Is it really great in the beginning? And then it wavers off because then you start to notice, okay, well, if I keep my embouchure more steady, then the note is better. Great. Now you practice that consistency. And so again, I always like to explain it in, in that way because I, it never dawned on me and I didn't understand it at first. So I always like to review it, even though, it's, even though it could be reviewed for a lot of you here today. Um, so again, we're thinking about breathing correctly, the consistency of our breathing, the consistency of our oral cavity, the consistency of our embouchure. Those three things are what we're focusing on in terms of when we're doing that long tone. Now, here's the last thing. I'll put my horn together here. And we want to talk about the consistency of the airstream. And when I hear an alto, I hear sounds like Cannonball. I hear Charlie Parker. I hear Kenny Garrett. I hear Eric Marienthal. Those are kind of my go-to guys in terms of um, my favorite alto players. And what they all have in common is big sounds. And I think that the other thing that's really important in terms of the embouchure, in terms of the oral cavity, in terms of the breathing correctly, is filling up the entire instrument. And that can really help in terms of improving your sound almost immediately. So I want, I want you to picture it like this. Is obviously the air is going into the mouthpiece here. Everybody knows that. But what I want you to picture the sound is not going in here. I want you to think about it coming out here. 
Because when we think about it coming out here, we fill up the entire instrument. Because the more buttons, the more pearls, whatever word you want to use there, the more we press down, the further the air has to travel. And even if we don't have any notes to push down, if we're playing open C sharp, um, the air still needs to travel from here to about here, which is like a foot. So we can't think about just our, 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 our air going in here. We want to think about it going all the way to here at the very least. And at, at, you know, ideally about a foot or six inches out from the bell. We want to fill up the whole instrument. And as we're playing our long tones, we're listening. Did the tone waver? And if it did waver, here's the complicated part. Which one of those four things was wavering. It could be one, it could be two, it could be all four. And that's why doing these long tones, in addition to our listening, in addition to developing our, our concept for sound, um, is so important. Because we're honing in our muscles. We're trying to gain consistency in our muscles. Consistency of our breathing, our airstream, our oral cavity, and our embouchure. Because the more consistent those things are, the more consistent our sound are going to be. Now, of course, when you're adding bends and scoops and, and, and vibrato, obviously you're manipulating the sound. But we need to learn to control it before we can do all that. So again, as I was mentioning, one of my goals for 2021 was to really focus back on my sound, back on my fundamentals, to really feel like I'm playing the saxophone really well again. Because in 2020, I was not inspired to play at all. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you felt that same way. So tone, 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 tone. You are never too old. You are never too good. You are never too anything to work on tone. I work on my tone every single time I practice. It's the first thing I start every practice session with. I want to go over two tone exercises besides just normal long tones that are going to be super helpful. Then we'll get into, and then we'll kind of stop and reassess for some questions and then dive into the next thing. Uh, guys, how are we doing on time? Pretty good. It's uh, about 7.06 here. So we've got uh, about as much time as you want, uh, but yeah, at least another half hour if that's cool with you, but take it as long as people stick around. <laughs> uh, so I want to go over again, two of my favorite tone exercises um, that I, pra I that I practice literally every time I practice. So instead of just doing your normal long tone, you want to do that on every note on the horn. It can, it can be tedious, but if we're doing it with the, if the tuner, if we're doing it with the metronome, we're working on our intonation, we're working on our time, we're working on our tone, we're working on the consistency of our embouchure, our oral cavity, our breathing, our, our, our consistency of our air, we're working on like eight or nine things at once. And I know for a fact that everybody here is not just working on saxophone. Everybody has jobs. Everybody has a social life, friends, family, loved ones that they spend time with. Um, you got homework, you got studying, you got a job, you got this, you got that. Life gets in the way. So what's super important in my practice sessions is being the most efficient with my time. And that way, if I only have 20 minutes, I can get a lot done in that 20 minutes. So that exercise is great, just holding up that note. But here's how we can kind of take it to that next level and magnify it a little bit. Is I want to start as soft as possible, crescendo to as loud as possible, and then decrescendo back down to as soft as possible. I can get a better start than that. to keep the tone controlled, trying to keep the intonation controlled, the timbre of the note controlled, as well as now we're really focusing on the air and the consistency of that air and being able to control that note and control the dynamics. So now that we're adding dynamics to the equation, that's just another thing that we're working on, as well as really emphasizing the air and controlling the air. So that's an exercise that I do all the time. It's super, super helpful. Now, here's my favorite tone exercise. That's definitely the most challenging tone exercise that I do. Um, so um, if you don't get to this in your practice session, that's totally cool, but it's incredibly helpful. Um, so here it is. We're going to start on C. 
We're going to take a breath and we're going to go C, B. Take a breath, B, B flat. Take a breath, B flat, A. So on and so forth. Now you may be asking yourself, why the heck is that so hard? Because this is what we're going to do. We're going to add the octave key, but we're still going to play in the low register. So what's happening here is we're working directly against how the saxophone was made. The saxophone is the most brilliantly designed of all of the, all of the horn instruments. It's the most recent 1836, 46. Does anybody know that? If that's correct, 1846, 36, something like that. But the flute is hella old. Clarinet's even older than the saxophone. It's the newest, which means it's the most brilliantly designed, which means you pop that octave key, the note goes up the octave. Amazing. Makes perfect sense. Now, so when we have that octave key down, we're working directly against how the saxophone was made, which means you're feeling a ton of resistance, which means you're feeling a ton of back pressure from the instrument. So it's going to sound a little bit different. So instead of, it's going to sound like this. Timbre of the note is a little bit different. And the only way to get that note out is to be super relaxed here, to be super relaxed here, and to shoot that air as fast as possible. And that basically reteaches our or re-emphasizes our muscles in terms of how they be how they should be shaped when we then go and play. So we're going all with the octave key. Now everything is nice and relaxed. Everything's nice and open. I'm shooting that air super fast and I let go of the octave key. Is that tone, if you could hear a little bit of a different timbre, a nice, super open sound, super direct, super laser focused. So those are my two favorite exercises as well as um, the tone exercise, just normal long tones. And again, when we're doing all these tone exercises, we need to be doing two things. We need to be thinking about our embouchure, our oral cavity, the breathing correctly, and the consistency of our air, as well as listening to the sound and noticing discrepancies in the intonation, the timbre, the, the, the tone quality, all of those things. The more you start to notice those little um, timbre differences and tone differences, the more you can start to get those muscles to be more consistent. And again, all of this, uh, I'll answer your question in one second, Zelda. Thank you. Um, all of this is in conjunction with listening and building our sound concept. So again, listen with your favorite, listen to your favorite saxophone players, play along to their recordings, try to fit your sound into their sound. The more clearly you hear their sound, or you, you think about their sound, you hear their sound, the more that that sound is going to come out. Um, oh, so how I was fingering that last exercise is just a normal C, um, but with the octave key down, but I was still getting the low note. So yeah, kind of like reverse overtones, essentially. Great, thank you. Any questions on tone? Again, we went over those some simple exercises. We're building our tone concept through listening. Um, any other questions on tone? We're going to dive into technique in a second. And again, even if this is review for some of you, which I'm sure it is, um, I have to remind myself of this stuff all the time because sometimes we get so caught up with the theory and the scales and the harmony and the transcriptions and all that stuff that we forget that the sound is the most important part. And so we always have to be working on our sound. It's the most important thing. When I, when I listen to a, a saxophonist, if, if he has a bad sound, I basically just switch to the next song or change the, change, change the song. Any tips on getting really low notes with a bell cover? Oh, especially in this time, definitely challenging, Brennan. Um, there's not really a, a good answer to that. Um, a lot of my low notes, I subtone. I don't really play a lot um, with like a, like a very full sound. I just go... To me, it sounds a lot vibier and sounds cooler, um, like a like a Lester Young or a Coleman Hawkins or a Ben Webster type of sound. Um, so maybe subtoning could help. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're when when you're cutting off the air escaping and you have the low B flat, that's the only place for the air to escape. So you're kind of in a, a loose loose situation, unfortunately. 
but try try subtoning it. That might help. Good question, Brennan. Um, any other questions on tone? Again, we are listening to our favorite saxophone players. We are playing along to their recordings. Um, we are building our sound concept. Again, we are in the information accumulation business. Um, and then we're doing all these exercises to hone those skills, to hone those muscles, to, to get those muscles to be more consistent. Last call on tone questions. Again, you can type in the chat. You can just turn on your microphone. You can talk to me directly. Um, you can message uh, the guys at Sax Shop if you want. Okay, cool. Let me take a sip of water and then we'll move on. Any thoughts on how much mouthpiece to take in? Ooh, good question, Jeremiah. Um, I haven't thought about this a lot, but we kind of, just like the embouchure, we kind of want to find that sweet spot because we don't want to be, let me take my neck off so it'll be easier to kind of show here. We don't want to be like barely, because then we can't really like control the read, but we also don't want to be because you're not able to um, control the read either. So you kind of want to find that sweet spot. For me, um, you can kind of see the, the, the teeth marks is kind of right in the middle of that little so uh, that little uh, clear pad. Um, that's kind of where my top teeth lay. So kind of just right in that middle point. So you, the kind of the middle point between uh, the edge of your ligature and the top of the mouthpiece is kind of where I where I do that. But experiment around because it could be different for you. It could be better for you in a different way. Um, any other questions? Great question, Jeremiah. Thank you so much. Also, don't be, don't be embarrassed or don't be scared to ask questions because I'm sure somebody else has the same questions. I had a lot of stupid questions um, when I was learning and that's how you learn. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Again, you can turn on your mic um, or you can type in the chat or message, message the guys over here. Okay, moving on. The other thing I've really dedicated myself to in the, in the past few months um, has been technique. Because when you don't play or you only, only practice for five or six times in an entire year, um, you should start to get some um, interesting results in terms of your dexterity and your technique. And the reason why to me this is so important because um, I listen so much to um, Chris Potter, Kenny Garrett, Charlie Parker, Sonny Stitt, and all of those guys play the absolute crap out of the saxophone. They are incredible in terms of what they're able to play. In terms of what they can play, they're, 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 let, me, let me phrase it this way. Their creativity is never hindered by their technical ability. And to me, when you have all this creativeness flowing through you, when you want to express all of these ideas, you want to be able to do it in any way that you want. And the more that we practice the technique and practice the just the instrument, the more we'll be able to express and not be um, bogged down by the instrument, by the piece of metal that we're holding. And I liken this to Chris Potter because in my, in my experience or in, in my opinion, um, he's the best saxophone player on the planet right now um, in terms of just his playing ability, his creativity, his, I mean, he's just a freaking monster to me. Um, he's also super, super nice. He's also a lot shorter than I thought he would be. He's shorter than me and I'm not really that tall, uh, which is a strange fun fact, I guess. Um, but um, he can just play anything that he wants. Any idea that he could possibly think about, he can execute it. And because he's such, such a monster in terms of the technical aspect of the piece of metal that we're all holding in our hands when we're playing is he's able to execute any idea. And that's, that's my dream in terms of what I want to get to is I don't want to be hindered in terms of, Oh yeah, that fingering is really hard. So I'm not going to play that during my solo. Like I don't want to be hindered by that at all. So in terms of the technical ability, we want to be practicing these things. So two little tips in terms of technique, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, for me, a lot of times if I'm practicing um, a scale, or if I'm practicing a, a passage or an etude or a transcription or whatever you could be practicing is most times it's not the entire etude. 
or the entire scale or the entire anything. A lot of times it's just that little piece that you need to finger through a couple more times and then the whole idea comes together. I like to think about it like this. If your car is broken down, do you need to get a whole new car or do you just need to fix that one part and then the whole thing comes together? The same thing with the transcription, with an etude, with a scale, with an anything. Is sometimes we just need to fix that one part. So the way that I like to practice it is practice intervals that are tricky for me. So I like to start with half steps or whole steps first. So for me, I want you to look at my hand right here when I'm pushing down that ring finger and you look at what terrible control I have of that ring finger because the pinky is moving, the index finger is moving and the middle finger is like out of control. And so, and that's the same thing with on my left hand. It's even worse on my left hand, on my left hand. So what that means is when I'm playing G to A, G to A, G to A, G to A, is it's not going to be that clean because I don't have that grade of control. So what I do is I, I play with the metronome. To try to get those muscles to move a little bit cleaner, a little bit more efficiently, a little bit more consistently. Now, again, those ring fingers, that's just me. It could be the, the, the middle finger for you. It could be the index finger for you. It could be the pinky. It could be whatever. But we start to notice in terms of our own weaknesses and we start to attack them directly. So again, for me, it's ring fingers. And I practice that G to A. I want both notes to be exactly the same. The same timbre, the same dynamic, the same articulation, the same length the same sound. I want everything to be the same because I don't want any discrepancies in terms of like I want it to be as even as possible. You do it with the metronome and we start to attack these problem areas. For me, another really tricky interval is D, uh, palm key D to palm key E because what happens is we, from D to E, we need to play that second, we need to add that second palm key at the same exact time as this top side key. So what happens to me is And you hear that It's like freaking shoes in a dryer or something. You don't want that at all. But if you're able to have the consistency of both hands moving at the exact same time, And if you even were listening super intently, the beginning of that was worse than the end of it as I got it more consistent on that second half. So I challenge you to find those intervals that are tricky for you. Another tricky interval for me is um, G sharp to side A sharp. Because this, this middle, this ring finger, which I mentioned was a problem area for me, needs to lift up as well as the same time as the side key. So a lot of times I get and it's super sloppy and super messy. But the other day I, I was like, okay, this is a problem area for me for a long time and I really need to get on this. So I spent 15 minutes practicing that interval. I spent 15 minutes practicing scales that had that interval. And then I practiced imp improvising with songs that had that interval in their melodies and intervals in their in in terms of how I'd be creating my ideas in terms of the chord. And at the end of that 15, 20 minutes, it got so much better because I spent time attacking it directly. Again, maybe the whole F sharp scale or the C sharp scale or the D sharp scale or the A or the B flat scale is um is not you know the huge challenge. Maybe it's just that one part of the scale. I saw a couple of questions in here. So let's stop and any tips for getting out lower right hand notes that come out higher? Um, I'm not sure what that means. Lower right hand notes that come out higher. Oh, I, I, I think I know what you mean. In terms of um, like the, the higher note comes out, 
It just means that we're not open enough in our oral cavity and we're not relaxed enough in our embouchure. And also making sure that we're pushing the air uh, a little bit uh, faster. That will really help with that. Nice and open, nice and relaxed. Um, I'll get to phrasing um, at the end. Jeremiah, remind me, remind me about that at the end. That'd be great. Just because I want to talk, talk about impro improvising and all that stuff at the end. <clears throat> okay, so again, another tricky interval for me is low C sharp to low D sharp because you get that pinky movement and you get all this all that fun pinky stuff. That was fine. It could have been better uh, in the beginning. But again, I'm listening for the inconsistencies in terms of my muscle movement. I'm doing it with the metronome. Attack your weaknesses. Practice your weaknesses. And again, sometimes it's just that one interval that can clean and put and bring in the whole thing together. On that note, uh, one of my first days in North Texas, um, all the freshmen, we had this little seminar um, and all of the um, professors were introducing themselves. So they were saying, um, hi, I'm so-and-so. I teach, you know, uh, saxophone. Thanks so much for being here. Looking forward to working with you. You know, BS, whatever they were saying. So the drum professor, Ed Soap, who's taught Ari Honig and all these incredible drummers, he stands up and he says, hi, I'm Ed Soap. I teach drums. Um, if you sound good when you're practicing, you're not practicing. And 18-year-old me was like, that's amazing. I love that. And it kind of reiterates my point of like, practice your weaknesses and practice them directly. Because the more you practice your weaknesses, the better they become. And it's really that simple. Like I'm going to spend 15 minutes on a weakness to turn it into a strength. I'm going to practice one weakness every day. That way in seven days, I'm getting better at seven things. 30 days, I'm getting better at 30 things. A year, I'm getting better at 365 things a year. When you practice your weaknesses head on. So I practice intervals. It's a little bit tedious. I'll be honest. It definitely is tedious. But if you're doing it with a metronome, if you're working on the consistency of your muscle movement, I see improvement in my, in my technique every time I do it. The other thing before we get to some more questions is everything that you practice in terms of scales, it could be arpeggios, could be transcriptions, could be anything. So we have to practice it the full range of the instrument. The reason why I say this, and again, this could be reviewed for a lot of you, but I need to be reminded of it because my weaknesses are probably like your weaknesses. It's the top register and the pinky register. Everything else kind of makes perfect sense. And as I was saying, the saxophone is so brilliantly designed that if we're playing G and we need to go up a note, all we do is lift up one note. Like it makes, it makes perfect sense to me. We go, we want to go back down. We push you back down. Like it just, it's brilliant to me. But what's not as... Um, easy, and I don't really like to use that word, but what is relatively easier um, is that. But now we have all these palm keys where we have these different combinations and we have all these pinky notes in different combinations. And obviously that's much more challenging than just going up and down the scale. So instead of you're playing your scale, we want to practice it. Practice it up to the highest note in the key, down to the lowest note in the key, and back to the root. If you do that with a metronome, one key a day, two keys a day, I guarantee you you're going to see results right away. Um, again, I've been focusing so much on different exercises. I only practice major scales, by the way, um, because the better you know major scales, um, everything else is just a variation of the major scale. Um, so knowing your major scales uh, is incredibly important for a number of reasons, improvisation, harmony, theory, um, the technique, obviously. So there's so many different ways to practice major scales. Obviously, I just played the scale just now, um, just normal. You can do it in thirds, fourths. Ah. I haven't done that before, but yeah, that. Um, we can do arpeggios. You can do a descending. You can do it ascending, descending. 
do it descending, ascending. You could do it ascending, descending with a chromatic approach note. I mean, there are so many variations of these major scales. If we're doing them in different keys, if we're doing them in the full range of the instrument, again, we're going to get better at playing the saxophone, which then helps our expressiveness and our creativity when we go to improvise. So again, I wanted to spend the most time on those two things, tone and technique, because I've been practicing that stuff a lot. And I know that you know, my favorite players and the, study, the teachers that I've studied with you know, are still practicing this stuff too. Obviously practicing improvisation and transcribing and learning about harmony and theory are equally as important. But to me, I want the fundamentals first. I want the foundation first. We're not gonna build a second story of the house first. We're gonna build the foundation and then we're gonna build the basement. Then we're gonna build the first floor. Then we're gonna build the second floor. Then we're gonna build the roof. We're not gonna build the roof first. So we need the foundations of tone and time and technique. And then everything stems from that. Okay, so um, I've been talking long enough, I think. Um, so how about some questions? I know we had one question about phrasing. Um, again, type your questions in the chat. This could be about performing. This could be about music school. This could be about um, learning to transcribe. This could be about improvisation, theory, harmony. Um, raise your hand, type in the chat, message this guy's at sex shop, um, or just turn on your mic and ask away. I'll answer the uh, any tips on phrasing. Um, it's a great question uh, for those of you who are listening on YouTube. Again, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, but YouTube cats who I can't see, welcome. And I hope you've been enjoying what you're hearing. Um, phrasing to me is a very weird word because it's one of those words that I think a lot of people throw around that I don't think a lot of people actually know what, what, what that means. Um, so I'm going to define it because I think it's really important to do that. To me, phrasing is like five or six different things at once. Phrasing to me is how long your phrase is from beginning to the phrase to the end of the phrase. How many measures is that phrase lasting? Is it an eight bar phrase? Is it a two bar phrase? Is it a four bar phrase, six bar phrase, whatever. How are you starting that phrase? Are you starting with a chromaticism leading to a chord tone? Are you starting on the chord tone? Are you starting on um, beat one? Are you starting on beat two? Are you starting on beat three? Are you starting on the and so on, so forth. And number, number four, number five is where are you ending the phrase? Are you ending it on the downbeat? Are you ending it on beat two? Are you ending it on beat three, beat four? And then what note are you choosing to end your phrase on? Are you ending on the third? Are you ending on the fifth? Are you ending on the root? Are you ending on the sharp 11? Are you ending on the nine? So on and so forth. And the reason why all of that is important is because to me, all of that defines phrasing. Because when you listen to Charlie Parker, I'll tell you a quick story. Very first time I heard Charlie Parker, I had no idea what the heck was going on. I didn't understand it at all. And it got to a point where I was like later in high school, probably like senior year. And I was like, it started to click in terms of what was happening. And the reason why it started to click is because I started to look at the Omni book and I started to actually study like what the heck was going on here? Because I was so overwhelmed by the tempo, the technical ability, how many notes he was playing, how fast the tempos were. I mean, some of these, some of these tunes that, that Bird plays are insane. And there's so much harmony moving and he's so much vocabulary and he's this and he's that. Um, but when I started to take a look and started to analyze what he was doing, it started to make perfect sense. Is he would resolve on the downbeat and he resolve on a chord tone. He would leave space before he started the next phrase. Okay, well, what does that do? That provides that phrase with tremendous clarity. Before you stop, you start the next phrase, there's a clear end on the last phrase. He's ending that phrase on a strong beat, on a strong chord tone. He started that with a little chromaticism, little triplet that led up to some line. And he followed the chord perfectly. He played the scale. He played a little bit of chromaticism. He played an arpeggio. Like, it was so like perfect to me. Like it was, it just made so much sense that he was playing exactly what the chord was telling him to play. He was, he was using voice leading. He was resolving the chord 
perfectly to the next chord. He was transitioning from one chord to the next using a scale, using a chromaticism, using an arpeggio. And to me, I think about phrasing like that for the, for that person who asked YouTuber um, is I think about phrasing in terms of where I'm starting and most importantly, where I'm ending, what note I'm choosing to end on and the space that I leave before the next phrase starts. Because the name of the game, this goes for everybody, is clarity. I'm looking for clarity of harmony, clarity of sound, clarity of time, clarity of your ideas. I'm looking for clarity of rhythm, of harmony, of melody. And if we're able to achieve that, to me, that's what makes a great solo. When you listen to Bird, when you listen to Lester Young, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, Sonny Stitt, whoever, clarity. So hopefully that answers your question about phrasing. I see a couple more um, questions here in the chat. How do you play really high overtones, Bobby? Um, do you mean the altissimo register, Bobby? Is that what you mean? I'll assume yes. Um, to me, overtones, and this may be a hot take here, uh, but overtones is like the most overrated thing that you can practice um and the reason why i think that is because all those tone exercises that i've mentioned earlier are way more important than overtones again just my opinion um but in, in order to play really high overtones it's all about um the tongue position and the throat position and the air um and that's how we get you know i can play one note here i'm going to finger the same note <laughs> like all of those notes just on that one fingering is about our tongue position is about our throat position uh, or our oral cavity shape and about the air and so a combination of those three things is really how we practice overtones and to me as i said i think overtones are overrated again just, that's just my opinion um but overtones are important in terms of learning to play the altissimo register in order to play you know, higher notes than F or G sharp or F or F sharp. Like all of those notes come from um, being able to control everything here. And again, that's why those exercises that we talked about at the beginning, Bobby, um, are so important because we're learning to control. We're learning to think about those muscles um, and those and those um, and those uh, those factors um, that lead into that. So hopefully that answers your question. Again, it's all about air. It's all about um, oral cavity and tongue position. Um, equipment, horn, mouthpiece, reeds. Great question. Um, so I play Andreas Eastman saxophone, um, 52nd Street. Um, I'll be honest with you. And actually, since Shane left, I can be really honest with you. Um, I was playing. So my, my dad's a saxophone player, as I mentioned. Um, and he, has, he had a Selmer Mark VI. And so when I was playing a beginner horn in high school, I would come home and I'd be like, dad, 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 dad. Like, can I practice on your Mark six? Like, can I, can I play it? And he's like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Go play it. So I come home every day from high school and just practice on his Mark six. And, you know, a few months goes by and I'm like, dad, you got to get me one of these. Like, this is incredible. This is an amazing horn. And so for my graduation present, before I went to North Texas, he got me a Mark six. And I absolutely love that horn so, so much. And so um, a couple of years goes by and I'm at USC doing my master's degree. I've been playing the Mark six for, you know, five, five or six years at this point. And also the two plus years, two or three plus years that I practiced on his. And so I won the perform with Mincer Eastman saxophone, uh, international saxophone competition. And they gave me a tenor and a tenor, a 52nd street tenor. And I'm like, okay, this tenor is pretty killing. Like, I love it. I love the sound. I love the openness. I love, um, you know, the, 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 um, the core of the sound. It's huge, like American horn sound. Um, I love it. Sounds great. And so a couple months goes by and they say, hey, we know you're an endorsed artist with us and you play the tenor, but what about playing the alto? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. I kind of like my Mark VI, so maybe not. And so a couple months goes by again, and I'm like, hey, we got this new alto. We want you to try it. It's the 52nd Street. You know, we kind of tweak some things, so come try it. I'm like, all right, cool. It can't hurt. Can't try. You know, I'll just, I'll just come try it. And I played it, and 
that was, I think, like 2016 or 15, 16. And I haven't picked up my Mark VI since. Um, and I really, really love playing this horn. It's so easy to play. Um, they also are coming out with an even newer model. It's called the St. George. It's absolutely incredible. All the key work is like amazing ergonomics and it just feels so easy to play. This horn is the same way. It's super comfortable. It has a great sound. Um, again, super easy to play, super responsive. Um, plays a little bit more in tune than my Mark VI. Um, but the character of the sound is very, very comparable. Um, it's a little bit darker, a little bit warmer, a um, little bit more depth than the Mark VI. The Mark VI is a little bit more laser focused, a um, little bit uh, brighter, a little bit edgier. But again, I haven't picked up my Mark VI since they gave me this horn. So I love playing this. It's the only alto that I ever play. Um, I'm not just like, oh yeah, I endorse this. And then I go to all my recording sessions on a Mark VI. Definitely don't do that. Um, so I love playing this horn. My mouthpiece um, is a, a Meyer 7M. It's like $80 at like your local uh, music store. Um, just like a random Meyer that I found. Um, my ligature is the Rico H ligature. If you can kind of see that. Um, again, super expensive. I'm also endorsed by Diodario Woodwinds. So I play their reeds, uh, 3M, uh, Jazz Selects Unfiled. Um, I don't really mess around with gear that much. Um, obviously, it's very, very fun too. And it's so fun to nerd out. So I'm really looking forward to meeting you guys in person and, and nerding out on your store. Um, but I really, I've played the same gear for a long time. The only mouthpiece I've really ever played was a Meyer 5. And then I moved to a Meyer 6. And then I moved to a Meyer 7. Um, again, this is an $80 mouthpiece. Mouthpieces are really insane these days with customs. And, oh, this is a model after this and that. And it can get really, really pricey. Um, so I just stick with what I have. To me, it sounds great. It's very comfortable. It's very versatile, um, which is very important to me. So that's my gear. Um, next question. What if you constantly feel out of breath or that you need to dump air? What do you mean by dump air, Brennan? You could hop on a mic. So, so say maybe you're playing along, but you feel like you just haven't been able to completely empty your lungs in a long time maybe you're not playing as strong as you thought you were and you just have to dump everything out and you feel something's wrong because i've been playing really loud but yet i'm still not using much air up i think maybe my tone could be better interesting so i had to, you play tenor or alto brennan both oh my dude i love it um okay so for me when I was, especially when I was switching from alto to tenor, I sounded like an alto player playing tenor, like for a long time. And the reason why I say that is because number one, the sound concept wasn't there. So I didn't do enough listening to tenor players like we were talking about in the beginning. But the other reason why is because like I was constantly running out of air, which means I wasn't taking the best, deepest possible breaths. Like we talked about in the beginning is to me, it's all stemming from breathing from the diaphragm. And if we're, if we practice just breathing, if we practice, um, you know, taking that air, taking those deep breaths, it really helps in terms of finishing phrases and making sure that, you know, we're able to play everything that we need to and not run out of breath. Is that, the, is, 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 am I answering your question correctly or you have the opposite problem? I was kind of trying to bring up both sides at the in one question is what I was trying to do like both when you feel like you're not getting out enough air and when you're running out is what I was trying to okay um so yeah the running out question definitely comes from breathing correctly um so definitely again I practice in front of a mirror in the practice rooms um when I was at school just watching my diaphragm expand and contract um really focusing on where my air is coming from because the more you have the more you practice that the more muscle memory it comes uh, a term that I haven't heard anybody else talk about, so I'm claiming to it, is air memory. Um, it's the same thing. Like we, we don't, we, we don't want to be thinking about where our air is coming from. Here we are on giant steps. We're in the third chorus. The rhythm section is ripping. And, oh, well, my last breath wasn't like, like we're not going to think about that when we're improvising. So we want, it, we want it to be as consistent of a process as possible. So we practice it in front of a mirror. Again, I literally... It sounds dumb, but I literally practice in front of a mirror, watching my 
watching my diaphragm expand and contract. That's number one. That's the running out of air problem. And the running or not using enough air is, can you just clarify your question one more time just so I understand it correctly? So I guess this is more of a what it could mean if you're realizing you need to um, dump out air every like, say, six measures or so. You just need to take your mouth off. You have no, maybe you don't have no choice, but you have to take your mouth off the instrument. Just dump all the air out of your lungs and take a fresh breath in. Oh, interesting. Uh, so I would say in terms of your phrasing, which is what we were talking about earlier, is we don't need to we don't need to finish the entire breath every single time like the phrasing should be a little bit more natural than that like we're not going to say like i'm going to take a breath and go hey brendan how's it going man how are you doing today i think so thanks th thanks so much for coming here and i really appreciate it and man those are really cool headphones you're wearing and i uh, really hope you're you're doing well and you're staying safe and you're practicing and you're doing all this stuff <gasps> And I really appreciate you being here today. And like, I'm not going to talk for the entire eternity of the breath, right? Like, I'm going to say, hey, Brandon, how's it going? Man, I really appreciate you being here today. So let that phrasing and let the natural conversation kind of guide your breaths as well. Like, we don't need to take a humongous, every breath is not the same. Like, we don't need to take a huge breath if we're playing a one bar phrase, right? So think about how our, our phrasing can be more like a natural conversation and be like, hey, Brandon, how's it going? Man, how's the weather today? Hey, I appreciate you coming here today. Like those are nice short little phrases. And that could be our, that, that could be the way that we improvise too. So every breath is not the same. Every breath is not created equal um, in terms of the length, because every breath determining on how we're going to play and what phrase we're going to play um, is going to need a different amount of air, but we do need to practice the diaphragm to make sure that that's as, as consistent as possible. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Killing. Thanks, Brennan. Appreciate it, bud. Um, all right, another question here. Brolin wants to know how many saxophones you own. Oh, great question. Um, so I have here, my Mark VI is here, even though I never play it. Um, I have my Eastman, so that's two altos. I have soprano, I have tenor and Barry. And then my other tenor is at my parents' house because it used to be my dad's. Um, so I own five. Wait, one, two, three. Yeah, I own five, but uh, six, the sixth one is up with my parents. I also play um, flute. Uh, I really hate playing clarinet, so don't get me started on that. So I, don't, I, don't, I try to keep it in the case. Um, and then I have an iwi as well. That's a really cool electric wind instrument that Michael Brecker and a bunch of uh, amazing saxophone players have played. I haven't dove in too much into that since I got it. Um, but uh, yeah, those are how many saxophones I have. Fun question. Thanks. Any other questions from YouTube or, again, you can turn your mic on and ask away, type it in the chat. Um, again, this could be about improvisation. This could be about um, making a career as a musician. This could be um, saxophone related, not saxophone related, listening, anything. Got a couple more minutes here. What's the name of the saxophone you play the most? Ooh, good question. Um, I definitely consider myself a alto player, um, but I definitely do recording sessions and gigs on tenor all the time. Um, I just did this recording session, actually. Um, you know, you see this microphone here, obviously. Um, and I just did a tenor session here the other day. Um, so I play tenor a bunch, but I definitely consider myself an alto player. To me, tenor is kind of too heavy. <laughs> Uh, Barry is like way too heavy. So I don't really like playing those because I don't like carrying those. Um, Alto is nice. I have this really small compact case that fits underneath the seat of the plane. So it's super light. I just keep it on my back shoulder. So I definitely consider myself an alto player the most. Um, I do love playing soprano. Um, and actually Eastman Sopranos, those 52nd Street Sopranos are the best sopranos I've ever played. Um, they're incredible. They're so in tune. The tone is amazing. So definitely check those out. Um, so yeah, alto. I definitely consider my alto uh, alto player. Um, yes, thank you, Emily. Appreciate you being here. I think you had to bounce. Um, Hila, how do you get my hair to do like that? Oh, good question. Um, blow dryer. It's a, there's not really any pro. Oh, there's a little bit of product, but um, blow dryer. That's the secret. 
Um, any other questions? Hey, Alex, this yes, is uh, Aaron from the Sack Shop. I have a question for you, actually. Um, yes, sir, Aaron, what you got? So I don't know how many people have uh, heard your original music, um, but I've been checking out your stuff for a while now before I even, we even realized like this was a possibility to get you on here. And oh, I just love the stuff you write. And I think besides like you being an educator and just someone who is doing what you're doing now, I think, you know, your compositional ability and just like ability to like produce an album is, is super cool. Thank and you. I was wondering, um, like, can you kind of walk through like what your production process is from um, conceiving um, music to writing to, you know, getting the band together, rehearsals to then getting in the studio and then like releasing the music and kind of talk about your involvement in the process, like, and what worked for you, things you've learned and I don't know, figure out some way to condense that into something, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that is Great. Long, yeah. but... Thanks, Aaron. Man, I, pre I appreciate the kind words, man. That means a lot. Yeah. Um, in terms of composition, um, I started off very bad at it. And I didn't write my first tune until I got to college. And um, I currently teach at the LA High School for the Arts. Um, and some of the tunes that these students are writing is like so ridiculous. And so I think about like, I, didn't, I wasn't even writing at that point. So these kids are leaps and bounds above where I were. But that's beside the point. Um, I was really bad at first, but something that really helped me in terms of compositionally was trying to compose like my favorite composers. And obviously melodies are copyrightable, so you can't copy somebody's melody, but you can copy the groove, you can copy the harmony, you can copy the orchestration in terms of what instruments are playing. You can copy, oh, I like how the guitar and the alto sounds together, or oh, I really like how the, tr the trombone and the tenor sax sound together. And starting to bank all of those different concepts in terms of what your favorite composers are already doing. What instruments are they pairing together? What, um, you know, what, 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 what type of chord progressions are they writing? How, how would you describe the melodies? And to me, my, my first couple compositions um, were directly inspired by my favorite composers. So Herbie Hancock and Pat Metheny, amazing guitar player, um, are two of my favorite composers. To me, Pat Metheny is probably my favorite musician of all time. Um, mm -hmm. He is a melodic genius and his melodies are always stuck in my head. And so what I did was I listened to them over and over. I sang them over and over and over. And then I started to analyze and figure out, okay, why are these melodies all stuck in my head? Like what was happening? And so that helped me in terms of how I was guiding my own melody writing and my own composition. So that's first. Um, and in terms of the album process, um, I actually just recorded my fourth album um, two weekends ago. So this is actually very pertinent to, to what I'm going through right now. Um, so I recorded two weekends ago um, and I wrote the music back in the summer. So back in June or July. And usually it takes a whole year to go from nothing to being, having something being released um, in terms of starting to write the music. I always try to write something um, that fits the musicians that I'm calling. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Um, how can I write something that's going to feature them the best? How am I going to write something that features me the best? Like what am, what am I really good at and how, how, how can I feature myself the best? That's really something I thought about a lot on this project that's coming out soon. Um, and then, yeah, um, we couldn't really rehearse um, because of everything that's going on. We had two, like very short rehearsals, but the week of the album. Um, so I had sent them um, kind of like MIDI mocks ups through logic and, and um, like exported from Sibelius and all that stuff that obviously kind of gives them sort of a vibe um, to kind of go off of, but um, obviously not the clearest picture. So rehearsing is very, very key um, and getting them to understand, okay, this is the groove. This is the vibe. This is this, I want this instrument here, this instrument here. Um, getting them to understand the concept. Luckily, before the pandemic, this band had been playing together a lot, so we kind of understood it right away. So that was helpful. Um, and then, yeah, we just recorded the album two weekends ago. Um, we're in the process of doing a couple more overdubs, um, some some more a synthesizer and um, keyboard overdubs. I'm going to do some vocal overdubs and some percussion. I have my shaker right here. I've been practicing my shaker. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so I have that to do this week is actually on the docket to finish all that stuff this week. Um, the month of May, the mixing engineer, who's also my best friend, um, who I went to college with, who's also mixed all my projects. He's going to be mixing it in the month of May. Um, we'll be mastering it in the month of June. I'll be releasing some videos in June that we were recording in the studio. Um, and then it should come out probably July to August. Um, and my goal with this album is to get it nominated for a Grammy. Mm. And the reason why I wanted to share that is because number one, I want to speak it into, into an existence. Mm. That's number one. <laughs> Um, but number two, it's been a goal of mine for a long time. And to me, goals have been a, something that has been um, incredibly influential in terms of how I structure my time, how I practice, what I practice, who I talk to, what questions I ask my teachers, um, it just helps focus everything that I'm doing. So my goal has been to, you know, get nominated for a Grammy. So, you know, I need to write the music. I need to arrange it. I need to rehearse it. I need to record it. I need to mix it. I need to master it. I need to release it. I need to market it. I need to get it on the Grammy ballot. I need to become a Grammy member. I need to market it to those Grammy voters. And then possibly fingers crossed, it gets nominated. Mm -hmm. So I love these long, I love long-term goals like this because there's like so many ladder rungs on the way to the top of it. Um, so it helps me focus a lot of those things. But yeah, in terms of composition, uh, again, I try to compose like my favorite composer that really helps me in the start. Um, and then the more you do that and the more you compose, the more often you compose, the easier that it becomes. Um, and, the, and the more you start to hear ideas as you're walking down the street or you, you know, you're in the shower and um, you start to sing something. Oh, I got to sing that melody. Then you go grab your phone and you're soaking wet and you sing it into your phone so you don't forget it. That's happened to me a bunch. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, my process in terms of all that. Awesome. And again, I really appreciate you checking out my music. It means a lot, Aaron. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, man. Any other questions, guys? Okay, I know it's getting late. What does the recording session usually look like? Um, so it depends. Um, I've recorded um, on Michael Bublé's last two Grammy-nominated albums, and that was like ridiculous because that's a very big budget project. Um, so it's a long session. The last one that we did was a double session. So it's three or it's two, three hour sessions. We had a three hour session in the morning, had a break for lunch. We had a three hour session in the afternoon. Buble was there singing with us. Um, he was super funny. He sounds unbelievable live. I don't know if anybody is a fan of him, but I was already a huge fan of him. Um, but his, 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 his ability to make everybody feel comfortable, to joke around, to laugh, we did it at Capitol Records, and like, which is legendary. It was freaking incredible. But for my album, um, it was like one day. It was like, um, it was at a cool studio, um, but uh, it's much more expensive for one person to do it than an amazing label to do it. Um, so that looks different. I'm a little bit more pressed for time because I was more on a budget than Michael Bublé would be. Um, so kind of every session looks different. I've done remote recording sessions here at my place. Um, I've gone and done um, remote recording sessions at somebody else's studio where it's just me playing along. I've done it where it's a whole band. I've done it where it's a string quartet in me. I've done it with, so every recording session looks different. Good question, Brennan. Any other questions? I know it's getting late. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys have ever have any questions, um, my email is alexhanmusic at gmail.com. Uh, shoot me an email anytime. Hey, I was in your master class for Brooklyn Center. Um, you know, hey, I, I'm wondering about this, blah, 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 whatever. I'll type it in the chat. Um, Alex Han. Oh, I got to get direct message. <laughs> Alex Han music at gmail.com. Shoot me an email. Uh, stay in touch. Would love to stay in touch with you guys. Um, and again, thank you guys for having me, Shane, Aaron, all you guys. Um, really really means yeah, a lot thank you this uh this is great thank you so much yeah. i appreciate it thank you daniel appreciate the kind words guys well cool yeah thanks everyone for joining again thank you so much alex this was fantastic and hopefully we'll see you sometime in the future come and uh come and check out the shop that would be amazing absolutely yeah. things are clearing up um We're i was so close <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm vaccinated so i'm feeling good but yeah me too yeah, yeah. yeah. aaron oh, just got his second one today yeah and he's still there. alive you yeah, know he's, still he's sitting in a chair but you know it's, maybe it's not right. tomorrow maybe tomorrow i'll be dead <laughs> yeah. but we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. That was yeah i hope to visit you guys in person meet you guys in person would be great to have that'd be amazing yeah, yeah. thank Can't you wait. so much that was a great great clinic great master class really appreciate it thanks again my pleasure guys thanks, thanks everybody for enjoying. cheers thanks Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.